Welcome to Bookachino Live, Wednesday, August 10th. We're talking about books coming out in the next four weeks. This is our, let's see, two year and one month um, that we've been doing this and looking forward to sharing a really great selection of books with you today. Let's get started by sharing your top picks from July's presentation. And remember, we always love to see what you're going out to pick. Ruth Ware is the It Girl, which is also one of my book reporter bets on selections. Jamie Ford, guys, you guessed it. It's a read with Jenna pick, and it's also a Costco pick. So you picked a book that's going to be really, really huge. Lucy by the Sea by Elizabeth Strout. Jennifer Chiavani with Switchboard Soldiers and Things We Do in the Dark by Jennifer Hillier, which was also one of my bets on selections. So there's your top picks from July. And let's get on to what we're going to see for August. Oh, and we have our answer to our survey question. Remember we asked you how many of you were planning to go see Crawdads in the movies or how many people had read the book? 84% of the people have read the book. And of this, 42% were going to see the film adaptation in theaters and 42% were going to wait to see it on a streaming service. So I thought that was very, very interesting to share with you. We did see the movie and... Um, I have to say that I was kind of underwhelmed by it, but it was really nice to see how they adapted it as well. So comments, I'm sure will fly into the uh, Q&A talking about that. Now, just do this. For fiction, let's go with our fiction titles first. We've got Stories from the Tenants Downstairs by Sadiq Fofana. And I'm really interested in this book because I heard him present it. And just think about everybody living in a building and the stories in this apartment building, they either weave these people together or whatever. I remember living in an apartment building when I was back in college and you knew bits and bites about the people in the building and you didn't know quite everything. So this is each short story in this electrifying collection follows a tenant and the Banneker Homes, a low income high rise in Harlem where gentrification weighs on everyone's mind. There's Swan in apartment 6B, whose excitement about his friend's release from prison jeopardizes the life he's been trying to lead. Mimi in apartment 14D, who hustles to raise the child she had with Swan, waitressing at Roscoe's and doing hair on the side. And Quinesha B. Miles, a former gymnast with a good education who wishes she could leave Banneker for good, but can't seem to escape the building's gravitational pull. We root for each of these characters and more as they weave in and out of each other's lives, endeavoring to escape from their past and blaze new paths forward for themselves and the people they love. And I just love the way this book was put together, like with those kinds of stories. Reminds me of that Paul Simon song, which has one man's ceiling is another man's floor. And you think about it when you're apartment building, you're all kind of bonded together just by that. So this is my first title to kick off with. Um, now we've got Carrie Soto is back from Taylor Jenkins Reid. This a book was not expected because she had a book out, you know, recently. And we're like, she's usually not a book a year kind of a person. So this is on sale on August 30th, just right in time for the U.S. Open, which is one of Tom Donatio's favorite things. Tom loves tennis. There's a little nugget about him that I'm sharing. So what we've got is Carrie Soto is fierce and her determination to win at any cost has not made her popular. By the time she retires from tennis, she's the best player the world has ever seen. Hmm, are we thinking of another tennis player when we hear this? Okay, the one that just said yesterday she's retiring after the US Open, you know, that one? Okay, she shattered every record and she's claimed 20 Grand Slam titles. And if you ask Carrie, she's entitled to every one. But six years after retirement, Carrie finds herself sitting in the stands of the 1994 US Open, watching her record be taken by a brutal, stunning player named Nikki Chan. At 37 years old, Carrie makes the monumental decision to come out of retirement for one last year and attempt to reclaim her record. Even the sports media says that they never like the battle axe anyway, even if her body doesn't move as fast as it did. And even it means swallowing her pride to train with a man she once opened her heart to, Bo Huntley. So there we've got Carrie Soto is back. Watch this as you watch the US Open. Got you all pulled. Next from Sarah Addison Allen, we've got other birds. And those who know I love turquoise, love the color of these birds over here. It's on sale on August 30th. Okay, down a narrow alley in the small coastal town of Mallow Island, South Carolina, lies a stunning cobblestone building comprised of five apartments. It's called the Delawisp and is named for the tiny turquoise birds 
alongside its human tenants who inhabit an air of magical secrecy. When Zoe Hennessy comes to claim her deceased mother's apartment at the Della Whip, she meets her quirky, enigmatic neighbors, each with their own story, each with their own longings, each with whose endings isn't written writ. When one of them dies under odd circumstances, the night Zoe arrives, she is thrust into the mystery of the Della Wisp, which involves missing pages from a legendary writer whose work might be hidden there. So there we've got other birds. Next, we've got The Deceptions from Jill Bylosky. And this book has been getting a lot of buzz. It's coming on September 6th. An unnamed narrator's life is unraveling. Her only child has left home and her 20-year marriage is strained. Anticipation about her soon-to-be-released book of poems looms. She's seeking answers to the paradoxes of love, desire, and parenthood among the Greek and Roman gods at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. As she passes her days teaching at a boys' prep school, spending her off hours sequestered in the museum's austere galleries, she's haunted by memories of a year-long friendship with a colleague, a fellow po poet struggling with his craft. As secret betrayals and deceptions come to light and rage threatens to overwhelm her, Pantheon of Gods assume remarkably vivid lives of their own, forcing her to choose between reality and myth in an effort to free herself from the patriarchal concerns, the constraints of the past and embrace a new vision for her future. Now, what's interesting about this is Jill is a poet. She's written a number of books of poetry. So this is a departure for her, a novel, something that she's done only a few times before. Next, we're going to do historical fiction from Emma Donoghue. You remember her as the best-selling author of Broom. We've got a book called Haven. It's coming on August 23rd. In 7th century Ireland, a scholar and a priest named Art has a dream telling him to leave the sinful world behind. Taking two monks, young Tryon and old Cormac, he rows down the river Shannon in search of an isolated spot on which to found a monastery. Drifting in and out of the Atlantic, the three men find an impossibly steep bare island inhabited by tens of thousands of birds, and they claim it for God. In such a place, what will survival mean? So it's Haven. It's another stunning cover. From Karen Robards, we've got The Girl from Guernica. It's coming on September 6th. On an April day in 1937, the sky opens, fire rays down upon the small town of Guernica. 17-year-old Sibby and her family are caught up in the horror. Griff, an American military attache, pulls Sibby from the wreckage. And when Germany claims no involvement in the attack, insisting the Spanish Republic was responsible, Griff guides Sibby to lie to, national, to Nazi officials. If she or her sisters reveal that they saw planes bearing swastikas, the Gestapo will silence them by any means necessary. As the war begins to rage across Europe, Sibby joins the underground resistance, secretly exchanging information with Griff. But as the scope of the Germany's ambitions seek, become clear, maintaining the facade of a Nazi sympathizer becomes even more difficult. And as Sibby is uh, drawn deeper into the fabric of uh, secrets, she must find a way to outwit an enemy that threatens to decimate her family once and for all. So there's what cut Karen's Robart's book. Next, we've got The Marriage Portrait by Maggie O'Farrell. Uh, she's the author of Hamnet, which I know that so many of our readers enjoyed. So it's nice to see her back from, with something else coming on September 6th. Florence, the, 19, the 1550s. Lucretia, third daughter of the Grand Duke, is comfortable with her obscure place in the Palazzo, free to devote herself to her own artistic pursuits. When her older sister dies on the eve of her wedding to the ruler of Ferrara, Moderna and Reggio, she is thrust into the limelight. The Duke is quick to request her hand in marriage and her father just as quick to accept on her behalf. Having barely left girlhood behind, she must now enter an unfamiliar court where a rival is not universally welcomed. Perhaps most mystifying of all is her new husband himself, Alfonso. Is he the playful sophisticate he appeared to be before their wedding? or the ruthless politician before whom even his most formidable sister seemed to tremble. So now we have the marriage portrait. Got the Ways We Hide by Christina McMorris. Now you're gonna remember her of, as the author of the book, Sold on a Monday, which I know so many of you loved and has now had 1 million copies sold. So the Ways We Hide 
is a little girl is raised amid the hardships of Michigan's Copper County. Fenna Voss learned to focus on her own survival. That ability sustains her even now as a second world war rages in faraway countries. Though she performs on stage as the assistant to an unruly escape artist, behind the curtain, she's the mastermind of their art. Ultimately controlling her surroundings and eluding traps of every kind helps keep her a lingering trauma at bay. Yet for all her planning, Fenna doesn't foresee being called upon by the British military intelligence. Tasked with designing escape aids to thwart the Germans, MI-19 seeks those who specialize skills in war nearing its breaking point. She reluctantly joins an unconventional team as an inventor, but when a test of her royalty uh, draws deep into the fray, she discovers no mission is more treacherous than escaping one's past. So this is a really interesting book. One of the things they did was they designed games and they would send them to the prisoners to play. And inside there would be silk maps about how to escape and what, to, what, what are things to do. So I thought that was very, very interesting to see all these tricks that people were putting um, away during World War II as ways to survive. Next, let's do some thrillers and mysteries. For Lisa Jewell, we've got The Family Remains, and she's the best-selling author of Then She Was Gone. Now, I reached out and I said, okay, why is she doing this, this, uh, this book? Why is she, what, what's, the, what's the reason for doing this? And it is because so many people were curious about the characters in one of her previous books, and they wanted to see what was going to happen and how they were going to come home. So there's always like a little trick. So I reached out to her publicist last night and said, why this one again? So Early one morning on the shores of the Thames, DCI Samuel Owusu is called to the scene of a gruesome discovery. When he sends the evidence for examination, he learns the bones are connected to a cold case that left three people dead on the kitchen floor in a Chelsea mansion 30 years ago. Rachel Rimmer has received news that her husband, Michael, has been found dead in the cellar of his house in France. All signs point to an intruder, and the police need her to come urgently to answer questions about Michael and his past. She really doesn't want to answer. After fleeing London 30 years ago in the wake of horrific tragedy, Lucy Lamb is coming home. When she settles in with her children and is just about to purchase their first ever house, her brother takes off to find the boy from their shared past whose memory haunts their present. They all race to discover answers to these convoluted mysteries. They'll come to find they're connected in ways that they never could have imagined. So here we've got the family remains. Next, we've got Widowland. And we did a contest for this at 12 o'clock today. And we did one a couple of weeks ago. This is a book coming from CJ Carey. It's got a really interesting premise. We've got London in 1953. 13 years have passed since England surrendered to the Nazis and formed the Grand Alliance with Germany. It was forced to adopt many of its oppressive ideologies, one of which was the strict classification of women into hierarchical groups based on the perceived value they brought to society. Rose Ransom, a member of the British uh, privileged galley class, worked for the Ministry of Culture, rewriting the classics of English literature to ensure there are no subversive thoughts that could give women any ideas. See where we're going, folks? Outbreaks of insurgency have been seen across this country, and suspicion has fallen on widow land. The rundown slums where childless, childless women over 50 have been banished. Rose is given the dangerous task of infiltrating widow land to find the source of the rebellion before their leader arrives from England for the coronation ceremony of King Edward VIII. I can do my Roman numerals and Queen Wallace. So there you have widow land. And Kate Quinn has called this a compulsing, terrifying read. Next from Sandra Brown, we've got Overkill. Those who have been with us for a couple of years know that Sandra Brown is my float in the pool book, usually in August. This one's coming out on August 16th. So what we've got is former Super Bowl MVP quarterback, Zach Bridger, hasn't seen his ex-wife, Rebecca Pratt, since their volatile marriage imploded. So he's shocked to receive a life-altering call about her. She has been placed on life support after a violent assault. Four years later, Rebecca's attacker, Ebon, the scion of a wild, uh, wealthy family in Atlanta, gets early release from prison. This ludicrous miscarriage of justice reeks of favoritism, and state prosecutor Kate Lennon is determined to bring him to justice. Rebecca's parents have kept her alive all these years. 
But if she were to die, Ebon could be tried on a new charge, murder. It isn't lost that in order for Ebon to be charged with Zach's murder, Zach must actually be the one to kill her. Ebon, recognizing the jeopardy is in, plots to make certain that neither Zach nor Kate lives to see the death of Rebecca and the end of his freedom. This is a really interesting premise there of what's going on. So we've got Babysitter coming from Joyce Carol Oates on August 23rd. In the waning days of the turbulent 1970s, in the wake of unsolved child killings that have shocked Detroit, the wives of several residents are drawn together with tragic consequences. There is Hannah, the wife of a prominent local businessman who has been, have, had begun an affair with a darkly charismatic stranger whose identity remains elusive. Mikey, a canny uh, street hustler who finds himself on a chilling mass mission to rectify injustice. And the serial killer known as Babysitter, an enigmatic and terrifying figure at the periphery of elite Detroit. As Babysitter continues his rampage of abductions and killings, these individuals intersect with one another in startling and unexpected ways. Next, we've got Fox Creek, which is coming from William Kent Kruger. We know we've got a ton of fans of Kent's um, that read Book Reporter. Um, you all were fans of we, um, Ordinary Grace, uh, This Tender Land, and his book last year, Lightning Strike. This is a return to his Cork O'Connor series. It's the 19th book in the series. Those who listen on audio, it's been the same audio narrator for all 19 of the books, which is pretty huge to be able for an author to have um, a, a narrator with him that long. It's on sale on October, August 23rd. The ancient Ojibwe healer, sorry, Henry Malot has visions of his death. As he walks the North Woods in solitude, he tries to prepare himself peacefully for the end of his long life. But peace is destined to elude him as hunters fill the woods seeking a woman named Dolores Marceau, a stranger who had come to the healer for shelter and the gift of his wisdom. Malot rides his, this stranger and his great niece, Cork O'Connor's wife, to safety deep in the boundary waters, his home for more than a century. On the last journey he may ever take to this beloved land, he must do his best to outwit the deadly mercenaries who follow. Meanwhile, in Aurora, Cork works feverishly to identify the hunters and the reason for their restless pursuit. He has little to go on. Desperate, he begins tracking the killers, but his own skills as a hunter are seriously tested by nightfall and a late season snowstorm. So there you go, Fox Creek coming on August 23rd. Girl Forgotten by Karen Slaughter. It's coming on August 23rd. Longville Beach, 1982. Emily Vaughn gets ready for the prom. For an athlete who is smart, pretty, and well-liked, this night should be the highlight of her life. Uh, but by the end of the evening, that e secret will be silenced forever, the secret that she possesses. And what is it? For 40 years, her uh, murder remains a mystery. Her tight new group of friends closed ranks. Her respected wealthy family retreated inwards. The small town moved on from her grisly attack. But all that's about to change. U.S. Marshal Andrea o Oliver arrives in Longville Beach on her first assignment to protect a judge receiving death threats. But in reality, she's there to find justice for Emily. Killer's still out there, and Andrea must discover the truth before she gets silenced too. This book, um, if you remember, any of you watch pieces of her on Netflix, Karen Slaughter was the author of the book that that show was based on. So there's a little backstory on Karen. Next from Robert Dugoni, who I know is also a big um, author that our readers love. We've got What She Found coming on August 23rd. It's the next book in his Tracy Crosswhite series. Tracy has agreed to go look for the dis into the disappearance of investigative reporter Lisa Childress. Solving the cold case is an obsession for Lisa's daughter, Anita. So is clearing the name of her father, a prime sex suspect who became a pariah. After 25 years, all Anita wants is the truth, no matter where it leads. For Tracy, that means reopening the potentially explosive investigations Lisa was following on the dark night she vanished, an expose of a likely mayoral graft. Shocking rumors of reserve Congress, city Congress councilman's criminal sex life, a drug task force scandal compromising the Seattle PD, and an elusive serial killer who disappeared just as mysteriously as Lisa. As all the pieces come together, it becomes clear that Tracy's in the midst of a case that will push her loyalties and her resilience to the limit. What she uncovers will come with even greater price than anyone feared. 
So there's Bob Dagoni's latest book. Then from Alice Feeney, we've got Daisy Darker. I love Alice's books. I have this one next to read in my room. Um, it's coming on August 30th. After years of avoiding each other, Daisy Darker's entire family is assembling for Nana's 80th birthday in Nana's crumbling Gothic house on a tiny tidal island. You know what's going to happen next, folks. It's one of these locked room mysteries. Finally back together one last time. When the tide comes in, they are going to be, you figured it out, cut off from the rest of the world for eight hours. Family arrives, each of them harboring secrets. And then at the stroke of midnight, as a storm rages, Nana's found dead. An hour later, the next member follows. Trapped on an island where someone is killing them one by one, the Darkers must reckon with their present mystery as well as their past secrets before the tide comes in and all is revealed. So once again, we've got a locked room mystery coming this time from Alice Feeney. Then we've got the Ink Black Heart, um, a, Corm a Cormoran strike novel coming from Robert Galbraith. And uh, we all know what Robert's real name is, don't we? Hmm? Don't we? Hmm. Let's just see. See who can guess that. And it's um, somebody who wrote, let's see, that big series of books, the Harry Potter books. And when she wrote her first book under this uh, name, um, what she decided to do was uh, she wasn't going to tell anybody that who she was. She wanted to see how successful her books could be writing as Gal uh, Robert Galbraith instead of a running under the name that she was doing for all the Harry Potter titles. And the book actually was doing okay. It was revealed and then all of a sudden hit the New York Times list and she was outed. So all of a sudden, J.K. Rowling is Robert Galbraith. Everybody knows who she is. And all of a sudden, these books constantly hit the list. So it's interesting because she tried to do this without being known as the author of the other titles. But when it got out there, it was immediately, this is what happens. And she wanted to see what could happen with her book, not having that moniker attached to it, not having that name brand. And it was interesting to see you know, what happened and then what happened after the name was revealed. So in this book, when a frantic Edie Ledwell appears in the office begging to speak to her private detective, Robin Ellicott doesn't quite know what to make of the situation. The co-creator of a popular cartoon, The Ink Black Heart, Edie is being persecuted by a mysterious online figure who goes by the pseudonym of Anom, Anom, Anime, Anime, Anime. Edie is determined to discover, uh, uncover his true identity, his or hers. She decides that the agency can't help with this. Raman thinks there's nothing more of it until a few days later when she reads the shocking news that Edie has been tasered and then murdered in Highgate C Cemetery the location of the Ink Black Heart. Robin and her business partner, Corman Strike, find themselves embroiled in a case that threatens them in new and horrifying ways. Next, we've got from Stephen King, we've got Fairy Tale coming on September 6th. Charlie Reed looks like a regular high school kid, great at baseball and football, a decent student, but he carries a heavy load. His mom was killed in a hit run accident, was 10, and grief drove his dad to drink. Charlie learned how to take care of himself and his dad. Charlie is 17, he meets a dog named Radar and her aging master, Howard Bowditch, a recluse in a big house at the top of a big hill with a lock shed in the backyard. Sometimes strange sounds emerge from it. Charlie starts doing jobs for Mr. Bowditch and loses his heart to Radar. Then when Bowditch dies, he leaves Charlie a cassette tape telling a story no one would believe. What Bowditch knows and has kept a secret all his long life is inside that shed it's a portal to another world. So there we've got fairy tale from Stephen King. Would love to know how this my man's mind works to come up with some of these stories. Next, we've got Killers of a Certain Age by Deanna Rayborn coming on September 6th. Billy, Mary Alice, Helen, and Natalie have worked at the museum, an elite network of assassins for 40 years. Now their talents are considered old school and no one appreciates what they have to offer in an age that relies more on technology than people skills. When the foursome is set on an all expenses paid vacation to mark their retirement, they are targeted one by one of their own. Only the board, top level members of the museum, can order the termination of field agents, and the women realize they've been marked for death. Now, to get out alive, they have to turn against their own organization, relying on experience and each other to get the job done, knowing that working together is the secret to their survival. And you know, I never thought what would happen to secret agents of a certain age. I mean, really out to pasture. Wow. Who knew? 
And now we've got a song of comfortable chairs from the number one de le ladies detective agency by Alexander McCall Smith. I love this cover. I love this series when it ran on television. I just think these books are so like, they're, they're just like wrap you up in a certain story in a certain time. And it's just so much fun. It's coming on September 6th. Rake Masuki's husband, Foodie, is in a bind. An international firm is attempting to undercut his prices in the office furniture market. He's always been concerned with quality and comfort. This new firm seems interested only in profits. To make matters worse, they have a slick new advertising campaign that seems hard to beat. Nonetheless, with Ma uh, Ramatosi's help, uh, Fudu comes up with a campaign that may just do the trick. Meanwhile, Ma Ma Makusi is approached by an old friend who has a troubled son. Grace and Pudi agree to lend a hand, but the boy proves difficult to reach and the situation is more than they can handle on their own. It require not only all of their patience and dedication, but also the help of Ma Ramtusi, Ram 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 Ramotsi and the formidable Ma Pato Patowani, Matuani. I'm so sorry, sorry, guys. I'm bad on these pronunciations in order to help the child. I do know that the pronunciation of MMA is Ma because yesterday Tom looked it up for me when we were working on pronunciation. So there's Ma. The rest of them, Masuki, Potawani, and Rama uh, Wutsi. Okay, I'm sorry, I had a little bit of trouble with. And then we've got some memoirs and biographies. This is one of my favorite books from this year. It's Bully Market, My Story of Money and Misogyny at Goldman Sachs by Jamie Fiore Higgins. It's coming on August 30th. And this book was actually moved up in timing after a story came out in Bloomberg about it. It's absolutely terrific. It's a page turner. And I am not somebody that like could knows much about the stock market, doesn't know much about like, you know, how you know more money is made and whatever, and how like these money managers and work. But this book gave me so much more insight. And also gave me insight on like, what's it like to be a woman working at one of these places. Jamie became one of the few women to hit the highest ranks of Goldman Sachs. She spurred on an obligation to her working class parents. She rose through the ranks and saw it all. Out of control, lavish parties, flowing with never ending drinks, affairs flouted in the office, rampant drug use, and most pervasively, a discriminatory culture that seemed designed to hold back the few women of people of color employed at the company. And Jamie tells a great story about her parents when she got out of school said, you need to go to the job for the most money, the place where you can really get the return on the investment that we've made all the time. And she went to do this job and she's thinking it's just gonna be a job where we're working out with money and we're making more money for people. And then she realizes all the hidden things that are happening behind the scenes. Despite Goldman Sachs having the right talking points and statistics, she soon realized that these provided a veneer to cover up what she soon found to be an abusive culture. Her account is one filled with shocking stories of harassment and jaw-dropping tales of exclusionary behavior. When she was told she only got promoted because she is a woman, when her coworkers, and this is really my favorite, mooed at her after she went to breast, um, a, a pump breast milk for her fourth child, and she was defying the man superior who advised her not to breastfeed, because after all, if you want to get ahead, that's not what you do. And you also don't have pictures of your children on your desk. No, not allowed to do that. You're supposed to only be focused on your job. Or when a male boy, um, boss used a racial epithet in front of her, other colleagues and clients without any repercussions. And what she sees is there's two stories here. There's people who are just there to make the money. And then there are people that are all of a sudden looking at their values and are their values being compromised. It's a brilliant story because not only does Dreamy accept what she did, but she also sees what she needs to do. And the story about how she comes to do that to leave is part of the thing that makes bully markets so interesting. So like I said, I don't have any knowledge of the markets. I don't have anything, but I read this book like a page turner. And a number of booksellers I spoke to said the same thing happened to them. So there you go. And next we've got 100 Saturdays, um, Stella Levy and the Search for a Lost World by Michael Frank. It's coming on September 6th. With nearly a century of life behind her, Stella Levy has never before spoken in detail about her past. And then she met Michael Frank. He came to our Greenwich Village apartment one Saturday afternoon to ask her a question about Judaria, a neighborhood in Rhodes where she'd grown up in a Jewish community that had thrived there for half a millennium. 
Neither of them could know that this was the first of 100 Saturdays that they would spend in each other's company. Estella traveled back in time to conjure what she felt like to come of this age um, in on this luminous legendary island in the Eastern Aegean, where Italians began governing as an official possession in 1923 and transformed over the next two decades until the Germans seized control and deported the entitled Duderia to Auschwitz. So this is a really interesting book. I heard Michael Frank talking about it and how he came up with the story and how he did the research for this book. So we've got 100 Saturdays. And we've got some October titles to look forward to and man, October is gonna be big. We start with Ellen Hildebrand who's writing Endless Summer. It's very clear that Ellen does not want summer to end because if you're writing about summer stories in October, you're definitely thinking in a totally different frame of mind that most of us will probably be raking leaves and putting on warm jackets. So it's coming on October 4th, and it's really interesting what she did here. So offering nine stories, prequels, sequels, and missing chapters from her books, some of which have never been published until now. So here are just three of the stories you'll find. Three years after Mallory Blessing's death in 28 summers, her friends gather for another eventful Labor Day uh, celebration on Nantucket in The Sixth Wedding. The marriage at the heart of Beautiful Day enters uncertain territory when Margot Carmichael encourages her husband to reunite with his ex-girlfriend in the surfing lesson. And the tailgate, the weekend before a Harvard, the weekend of a Harvard-Yale football game, uh, recharts the course of matchmaker Dabney Kimball's first and abiding true love. So here you've got a collection of stories that make you keep thinking summer and bring back some of her characters. It's kind of fun that she's doing that. Next, we've got Mad Honey that's coming from Jody Pico and Jennifer Finney Boylan coming on October 4th. And Jody's written before with her daughter. This is the first time I see her writing with another author as well. Livia McAfee, Picture Perfect Life was upended when her husband revealed a darker side. She never imagined that she would end up back in her sleepy New Hampshire hometown with her son, Asher. Meanwhile, Libby Campanello and her mother relocate to Adams, New Hampshire for her final year of high school for what they hope will be a fresh start. For just a short while, these new beginnings are exactly what Olivia and Aunt Lily need. Their paths cross when Art Asher falls for the new girl in school, and Lily can't help but fall for him too. Then one day, Olivia receives a phone call. Lily is dead, and Asher is being questioned by the police. Olivia is adamant that her son is innocent. As the case against him unfolds, she realizes he's hidden more than he shared with her. So there we've got Mad Honey, and I'm sure the book we read the book, we'll understand more about the title. Now we've got our Missing Hearts coming from Celeste Ning. It is coming on October 4th. This is a very anticipated title. 12-year-old Bird Gardner lives a quiet existence with his loving but broken father, former linguist who now shelves books in a university library. For a decade, their lives have been governed by laws written to preserve American culture in the wake of years of economic instability and violence. To keep the peace and restore prosperity, the authorities are now allowed to relocate children of dissidents, especially those of Asian origin, and libraries have been forced to remove books seen as unpatriotic, including the work of Bird's mother, Margaret, a Chinese-American poet who left the family when he was nine years old. Bird has grown up disavowing his mother and her poems, but when he receives a mysterious letter containing only a cryptic drawing, he's pulled in a quest to find her. So there we've got all our missing, our missing hearts. Next from Nelson DeMille, we've got The Maze. It's a John Corey novel. Anybody who's loved Jane, John Corey in the past, my husband has already finished this one and says it's terrific. So um, NYPD homicide detective John Corey is forced into retirement from his last job as a federal agent with the Diplomatic Surveillance Group. He's restless and looking for action. So when his former lover, Detective Ben Penrose, ap appears with a job offer, he must once again make decisions about his career and reuniting with Beth. I've read the first hundred pages. It's very funny about how he goes about making these decisions because when you when Nelson writes a book, you're in his head as much as what's going on on the page. It's just really, really, really fun to see. You're seeing what's happening inside all the characters um, as, as he's writing on the page. Inspired by and based on the still unsolved Gilgo Beach murders, the maze takes a reader on a dangerous hunt for an apparent serial killer who's made her, murdered nine and maybe more prostitutes and hidden their bodies in the thick, thick undergrowth on a lonely stretch of beach. As Corey digs deeper into the, pace, which, uh, the case, which has made national news, he comes to suspect that the failure of the local police to solve the sensational case 
may not be the result of their inexperience and incompetence. It may be something else, something more sinister. So there we've got the maze. Next, we've got The Boys from Biloxi by John Grisham, which is coming on October 18th. For the last hundred years, Biloxi was known for its beaches, resorts, and seafood industry, but had a darker side. Notorious for corruption and vice, everything from gambling, prostitution, bootleg liquor, and drugs to contact killings. The vice was controlled by a small cabal of monsters, many of them rumored to be members of the Dixie Mafia. Keith Rudy and Hugh Malco grew up in the Biloxi in the 60s and were childhood friends, as well as Little League All-Stars. Anybody who knows John Grisham knows he loves baseball. But as teenagers, their lives took them in different directions. Heath's father became a legendary prosecutor determined to clean up the coast. Hugh's father became the boss of Biloxi's criminal underground. Heath went to law school and followed his father's footsteps. And Hugh preferred the nightlife and worked in his father's clubs. The two families were headed for a showdown, one that would happen in a courtroom. So there we've got the boys from Biloxi. And we've got the last chairlift, which is coming from John Irving. This is a very big novel, literally big, thick novel coming on October 18th. I think they, they were saying it's been um, maybe 10 years since he's done something you know, in depth like this. And it's um, set in Aspen, Colorado in 1941, which is interesting. Rachel Brewster is a slalom skier at the National Downhill and Slalom Championships. Little Ray, she's called, finishes nowhere near the podium, but she manages to get pregnant. Back home in New England, Little Ray becomes a ski instructor. Her son, Adam, grows up in a family that defies conventions and evades questions concerning the eventful past. Years later, looking for ask answers, Adam will go to Aspen to the Hotel Jerome where he was conceived. And there Adam will meet some ghosts and they won't be the first or the last ghosts that he sees. So there we've got the last chairlift. And somebody who loved to ski, love, love, loves to ski, that chairlift is just so enticing. I wanna be on it. Next, we've got Liberation Day stories coming from George Saunders on October 18th. He's back with his first collection of short stories since 10th of December. He's gonna explore ideas of power, ethics, and justice, and cut to the very heart of what it means to live in a community with our fellow humans. Love Letter is a tender missive from grandfather to grandson in the midst of a dystopian political situation in the not too distant, all too believable future. that reminds us of our obligations to our ideals, ourselves, and one another. Ghoul is sent in a hell-themed section of an underground amusement park and follows the exploits of a lonely, morally compassed character who comes to question everything he took for granted about his reality. In Mother's Day, two women who love the same man come to an existential reckoning in the middle of a hailstorm. And my house comes to turn with the haunting nature of unfulfilled dreams and the inev inevitability of decay. So there we've got Liberation Day. Next, we've got The Passenger coming from Cormac McCarthy. And you know, he's the author of The Road. It's 1980, past Christian, Mississippi. It's three in the morning when Bobby Western zips the jacket of his wetsuit, plunges from the Coast Guard tender into darkness. His dive light illuminates the sunken jet, nine bodies buckled in their seats, hair floating, eyes devoid of speculation. Missing from the crash are the pilot's flight bag, the plane's black box, and the 10th passenger. But how? A collateral witness to machinations that can only bring him harm, Western is shadowed in body and spirit by men with badges, by the ghost of his father, inventor of the bomb that melted glass and flesh in Hiroshima, and by his sister, the love and ruin of his soul. And then you can look for Stella Maris, the second installment in this two-volume passenger series on sale on December 6th. So you've got something from Cormac now and something to look forward to on December 6th. Now we're going to go to our notable August paperback releases. We've got Stephen King's Billy Summers, Harlem Shuffle from Colson Whitehead, The Reading List from Sarah Nisha Adams. And just so you know, this is going to be a contest book and what's your book group reading. So if you tell us what your book group reading, you'll be eligible to win one of um, three sets of 12 copies of The Reading List for your group. From Lisa Scottolini, we've got What Happens to the Bennetts that's now out in paperback. And from Riley Sager, we've got Survive the Night. So there are five books that we're thinking are notable from August paperback releases. And I have picked books, 26 books as my bets on selections so far this year. Uh, these are the books that I'm saying, if you pick this up, I think you're going to love it. 
And I look back sometimes and I say, do I do still think they're going to love it? And I want you to know what each one of these, some of these were big books. Some of them were smaller books, but each one of them resonated with me as something I would hand to somebody, the write somebody and say, I think you would enjoy reading this. So there we've got what I've got selected so far and more in my brain, including right now um, I am reading Fellowship Point which is absolutely amazing. I'm hoping to interview the author next week. It's one of those big, thick books that is taking me longer to get through than anything else I've read. I think I've been reading on this for two plus weekends. And for me, that's a lot of reading, but I'm also actually loving the prose and I'm loving the story and I'm not minding that it's taking me this long to read it. And every time I pick it up, I find myself immersed back into the story. And that's really, really a wonderful thing, especially since I have a lot going on right now. So then we've got what are our recent talk to um, videos and podcasts, which you can find on YouTube, wherever you listen to podcasts. The last time I looked, we had more than 250,000 um, people watching our views on uh, our YouTube videos. So 250,000 of our um, videos have been watched. And on podcasts, I think we we're up to like 81,000 the last time I looked. So it's interesting to see how many people are going and listening to these interviews. They're not short. They might be a long walk on the park instead of a simple walk around the house. But each one, I'm trying to get in depth with the author and really talk to them about why the book resonated with um, us and with me. And also, as I was reading it, what our reviewers had said and also what I feel like they would want to share about the backstory, the things that they might not have said otherwise in the book. So really enjoying these. I'll have a number that I'll be scheduling for the next couple of weeks. And here's just some great reading. Our next Book of Chino Live is going to be on Wednesday, September 14th. Yes, after Labor Day, the time where I will start pasting the leaves back on the trees because I will not want summer to go away. And we'll be doing books from September 13th through October 4th. And we will be peeking ahead at November. And sign up for this will be available later on today. So thank you for joining us. 